One must not improve others, it seems. To do things oneself in minutest detail, that is what is needful. No longer should it be said, you should, but rather I should, if I had not already thought, I will. What a burden and danger is vanity. There is nothing about which one could not be vain. Nothing is more difficult than to define the limits of vanity. One who creates should be especially wary of success, though needs it. Carl Jung once famously wrote, No tree can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. And it's a perfect quote to begin this metaphysical exploration. Jung is about to be humbled as he foreshadows in the black books prior to entering into a visionary experience. This inner happening brings Jung to higher levels of conscious awareness, yet it is at a cost to his subjective pride, as he must confront a shadow within. And although his experience is subjective, there is an objective reality, an objective truth we can all learn from Jung's inner vision. This inner personality Jung is about to meet is not his devil, the red one, nor the scholar and his daughter in the castle, but a lowly one. And through this experience, Jung reflects on the depths and heights, being and becoming, chaos and order, ultimately the unconscious and the ego. As you will come to see throughout this back and forth, Jung provides timeless metaphysical wisdom that any lover of wisdom will enjoy. But before the vision and Jung's own commentary, we must first take a closer look at the quotes we began with. I could honestly drag these quotes out into an entire video as they cover so much depth and they each center on individuation. Each play off each other as the first makes the case for the ego and its heights while the second speaks of its dangers. And this is the tricky balance of individuation, allowing one's consciousness to expand without an inflation without distorting its unfoldment. Individuation requires consciousness, an ego, for the unconscious to be known. And this ego must stand its ground, as Jung writes throughout his collective works. But if the ego gets in the way, then the essence is not given its true form. And we all know how easy it is for the ego to become inflated, an idea we will discuss later in this commentary. The chaos remains chaotic, and there's no true order, true understanding of it. Without an ego, a subjective awareness, individuation or consciousness ceases to be. But with the ego comes vanity, as well as other egotistical tendencies. Now, there is one quick point before we proceed. Some, possibly many of you may not like what you just heard, especially those in the helping fields. As you may be asking, how could you stay doing your job that is improving others if Jung says one must not improve others? While I'm not here to answer for Jung, what I will say is consciousness learns through experience. And if one is dependent on their therapists, on their leaders, and on AI to get by, then what's the point of being individually conscious? If we all tied our own shoes and let another learn how to tie their own, not only will consciousness improve throughout individuals, but we'll have a stronger community. A community that stands alone, yet together, instead of what we do today. The inversion, that is standing together, yet split apart and thus single in community and communal in our singleness. A way of life completely opposite of individuation. As individuals seek community and identity, a box in their singleness, and then in this community, they split apart from other communities outside their community and they become single in the communal. Whereas individuation breaks one free from such boxing to stand as a one while finding community in the depths of the unconscious that is the essence we all swim. And this is exactly where we are headed as Jung is about to enter into another black book act of imagination. So for anyone interested in these insights, the mere psychology and philosophy of this inner scene, you could skip to the time shown on the screen. As for the act of imagination that follows, I will read it in full from the black books to grasp what Jung experienced within that led to his profound comments in the commentary. So let us join Jung within 
where he meets another archetypal figure of the unconscious. One of the lowly, Black Book entry from December 29th, 1913. It is evening, a snow-covered landscape. I am wandering once more. Somebody who does not look trustworthy has joined me. Most notably, he only has one eye and a few scars on his face. He is poor and shabbily clothed, a tramp. He has a black stubbled beard that has not seen a razor for a long time. Because of the cold, he has buttoned up his collar and his nose is slightly red. I have a good walking stick for any eventuality. It's damned cold, he remarks after a while. I agree. After a long pause, where are you going? I'm going to the next village, where I plan to stay in the hostel overnight. I like to do that too, but we'll hardly manage to get a bed. Have you no money? Well, let us see. Are you out of work? Yes, times are bad. Until a few days ago, I was working for a locksmith, but then he had no more work. Now I'm on the road looking to earn something. Wouldn't you work for a farmer? There's always a shortage of farm labor. Working for a farmer doesn't suit me. It means getting up early in the morning. The work is hard and wages are low. But it is always much more beautiful in the country than in a town. It is boring in the country. One meets nobody. Well, but there are also villagers. But there is no mental stimulation. The farmers are like clods. I look at him astonished. What? He even wants mental stimulation? Better that he honestly earn his keep, and when he has done that, he could think of mental stimulation. But what kind of mental stimulation is there in the city? You can go to the cinema in the evenings. That's of great interest, and it's cheap. You get to see everything that happens in the world. I have to think of hell, where there are also cinemas for those who despise this institution on Earth, and did not go there because everybody else found it to their taste. Shall even the cinema be a universally valid truth? Oh, Salome. What interests you most about the cinema? One sees all sorts of stunning feats. There was one man who ran up houses. Another carried his own head under his arm. Another even stood in the middle of a fire and wasn't burnt. Yes, it's really remarkable. The things that people can do. And that's what this fellow calls mental stimulation? But wait. That does seem remarkable. Didn't Felix and Regula also carry their heads under their arms? Didn't St. Francis and St. Ignatius of Loyola levitate? And what about the three men in the fiery furnace? Isn't it a blasphemous idea to consider the Acta Sanctorum as historical cinema? Today's miracles are simply somewhat less mythical than technical. I regard my companion with feeling. He lives in the history of the world. I think... Certainly it is very well done. Did you see anything else like this? Yes, I saw how the king of Spain was murdered. Yes, but he wasn't murdered at all. Well, that doesn't matter. In that case, it was another one of those damned capitalist kings or emperors. At least they got one of them. If only all of them were taken out, the people would be free. Not a word more dare I say. Wilhelm Tell a work by Frederick von Schiller. The man is standing right in the stream of heroic history, one who announces the murder of the tyrant to the new peoples. Conversing that way, we have arrived at the inn, a country tavern, a reasonably clean parlor with an unslightly iron oven. A bar or buffet with a pressure tap for beer stands there disturbingly and inappropriately. A few men sit with tepid beers in the corner playing cards. I am recognized as a gentleman and led into the better corner where a checkered cloth covers the end of a table. The other sits down at the far end of the table and I decide to have him serve the proper evening meal. He is already looking at me full of expectation and hunger with his one eye. Where did you lose your eye? In a brawl, but I still got my knife into the other fellow pretty nicely. After that, he got three months. They gave me six but it was beautiful in prison. At the time, the building was completely new. I worked in the locksmiths and the blacksmiths. There wasn't much to do there, yet there was enough to eat. Prison really isn't all that bad. 
I look around to make sure that no one else is listening to me talking to a former convict, but no one else seems to have noticed. I seem to have ended up in well-to-do company. Are there also prisons in hell for those who never saw the inside of one? Incidentally, mustn't it be a particularly beautiful feeling to hit rock bottom in reality at least once? Where there is no going down any further, but only upward beckons at best? Where for once one stands before the whole height of reality? So after that, there I was, out on the street, since they banished me. Then I went to France, though I did not understand the language at first, but nevertheless it worked, and it was lovely. What demands beauty makes? Something can be learned from this man. The soup arrives, a thin hot broth, which I spoon down critically. He gulps it down devoutedly, and soon he has completely emptied an entire enormous bowl of soup. Why did you have this brawl? It was over a woman. She had a bastard from him, but I wanted to marry her. Otherwise, she was fine. After that, she didn't want to anymore. I haven't heard back from her since. How old are you now? I'll be 35 in spring. Once I find a proper job, we can get married right off. I'll find myself one. I will. There's something wrong with my lungs, though. But that'll soon get a bit better again. He has a coughing fit. I think that the prospects are not good for a marriage and slightly admire the poor devil's unswerving optimism. After dinner, I go to bed in a humble room. I hear how my comrade settles into his lodgings for the night next door. He coughs several times heftily and dryly. Then it becomes still. I fall asleep. Suddenly I awaken at an uncanny moan and gurgling mixed with a half-stifled cough. I listen attentively for a while. No doubt, it is my comrade. It sounds like something dangerous. I jump up and throw something on. I open the door of his room. Moonlight floods in. The man lies is still dressed on a stack of straw. A stream of blood is flowing from his mouth and from a large puddle on the floor. He moans half choking and coughs out a lot of blood. He wants to get up but sinks back again. I hurry to support him but I see that the hand of death lies on him. He is sullied with blood twice over. My hands are covered with it. A final word twists out of his mouth. Mother. Then every stiffness loosens. A gentle shudder passes over his limbs, and then everything is deathly still. God, where am I? Are there also cases of death and hell for those who have never thought about death? I look at my blood-stained hands, as if I were a murderer or sacrificer. Was it not the blood of my brother that sticks to my hands? The moon paints my shadow black on the white chalk walls of the chamber. What am I doing here? Why this horrible drama? I look inquiringly at the moon as the only witness of the scene. How does this concern the moon? Has it not already seen worse? Has it not shone into the broken eyes of hundreds of thousands? This is certainly of no avail to its eternal craters, one more or less. Death, does it not uncover the terrible deceit of life? Therefore, it is probably all the same to the moon, whether or how one passes away. Only we kick up a fuss about it with what right. What did this one do? He worked, laughed, drank, ate, slept, gave his eye for the woman, and for her sake forfeited his good name. Furthermore, he lived the human myth after a fashion. He admired the wonder workers and praised the death of the tyrant and vaguely dreamed of the freedom of the people. And then, then he died miserably, like everyone else. That is generally valid. Thanks to you, my soul. I place myself on the lowest fundament, from here there is no further downward, but only upward. What shadows over the earth? All lights gutter out in final despondency and loneliness. Death has entered, and there is no one left to grieve. This is a final truth or no riddle. The most extreme human truths are no riddles. Why did we think they were riddles? What delusion could make us believe in riddles? My soul, you are terribly real. You have set me with hard thrust on the sharp stones of misery and death. I grow weak and miserable. My blood, my precious life blood trickles away between these stones. 
I step clear of this chamber of horror and secretly save my bare life. My soul, I shudder at you. I really must be a player at life who needs to hear such words. Before getting into the commentary, I want to highlight something that came up in the act of imagination. That is being brought down to the lowest point. We all love to gloat and glamour in the heights of life. We're able to be in it and be present, but the other end is a whole different story. When we are brought low, we hide, repress, suppress, project, mask, and the like. But it is just there where any true heights may be reached. I personally had to go through this humbling, hence the channel name. But this is where I found the essence, where the spirit lies. And this divinity below is nothing new in Western thought. Think of Dante's Inferno, the Greek underworld, Jung's Red Book experience. Humbling oneself is the way to awakening. And after the humbling, the lowering, death and hell. It is not just some fluffy climb up the mountain. But as individuation moves, cyclical. So let us join Jung as he comments on his act of imagination, as well as the paradox on how one can be while becoming. Jung begins, We stand on the spiky stones of misery and death. A destitute joins me and once admittance into my soul, and I am thus not destitute enough. Where was my destitution when I did not live it? I was a player at life, one who thought earnestly about life and lived it easily. The destitute was far away and forgotten. Life had become difficult and murkier. Winter kept going on, and the destitute stood in snow and froze. I joined myself with him since I need him. He makes living light and easy. He leads to the depths, to the ground where I can see the heights. To truly grasp these comments, one must understand the balance between the ego, or one's subjective awareness, and the unconscious. In our depths, we are whole, but the ego likes its little complexes. It likes to pick its parts apart from the whole. And because the ego is prideful, the warning hinted at in the beginning of this video, it does not like to admit the parts that don't fit in. This is how a shadow is built. Anything outside one circle of acceptance is thus left in the depths to become a shadow. Jung says a destitute wants to enter, but I'm not destitute enough. What this means is that his ego has lost touch with his greater personality. As he says he was a player at life, and the destitute was far away and forgotten. But the important thing is that it wasn't gone, but in the shadows of his consciousness. And as life got murky and difficult, Jung says he needed him, not to bring him up, lift his spirits, but meet him where he needed to see clearly. This point is one to reflect on, as the psyche is much deeper than one's ego. Jung concludes this first paragraph with the whole point of the visionary experience. He says the destitute leads to the depths, to the grounds where he could see the heights. And this is the dynamic where Jung's about to take us. Without the depths, I do not have the heights. I may be on the heights, but precisely because of that, I do not become aware of the heights. I therefore need the bottom most for my renewal. If I am always on the heights, I wear them out, and the best becomes atrocious to me. But because I do not want to have it, my best becomes a horror to me. Because of that, I myself become a horror, a horror to myself and to others, and a bad spirit of torment. Be respectful and know that your best has become a horror. With that, you save yourself and others from useless torment. A man who can no longer climb down from his heights is sick, and he brings himself and others to torment. If you have reached your depths, then you see your heights light up brightly over you, worthy of desire and far off, as if unreachable, since secretly you would prefer not to reach it since it seems unattainable to you. For you also love to praise your heights when you are low, and to tell yourself that you would have only left them with pain, and that you did not live so long as you missed them. It is a good thing that you have almost become the other nature that makes you speak this way. But at your bottom, you know that it is not quite true. 
At your lowest point, you were no longer distinct from your fellow beings. You are not ashamed and do not regret it. Since insofar as you live the life of your fellow beings and descend to their lowliness, you also climb into the holy stream of common life, where you are no longer an individual on a high mountain, but a fish among fish, a frog among frogs. We begin Jung's metaphysics on the heights and depths. Consciousness as a whole, that being the ego and the collective unconscious. And it all begins with the depths, literally, as in we're born out of the depths. We begin there and become from there and conclude there. And it's easy in adolescence and adulthood to lose that grounding. But unfortunately, when one loses their grounding and remains only on the heights, as Jung says, it wears off. Any inflation pops. The house of cards always falls. Nothing solely on the heights will fulfill. If you get power, you'll want more power. Sex, more sex. Money, more money. And the true reason for this is because the heights are always created. And anything created must die. Everything that becomes, everything not eternal like the depths, dies. So anyone clinging to the heights is just clinging to death. Let go. Reconnect with your depths, your essence, and see what is to come. This is what it means to live according to nature, with the universe, with reality. Jung continues on the heights and depths of consciousness. Your heights are your own mountain, which belong to you and you alone. There you are individual and live your very own life. If you live your own life, you do not live the common life, which is always continuing and never-ending. The life of history and the inalienable and ever-present burdens and products of the human race. There you live the endlessness of being, but not the becoming. Becoming belongs to the heights and is full of torment. How can you become if you never are? Therefore you need your bottommost, since there you are. But therefore you also need your heights, since there you become. If you live the common life at your lowest reaches, then you become aware of yourself. If you are on your heights, then you are your best, and you become aware only of your best, but not that which you are in the general life as a being. What one is is one who becomes, no one knows. But on the heights, imagination is at its strongest. For we imagine that we know what we are as developing beings, and even more so, the less we want to know what we are as beings. Because of that, we do not love the condition of our being brought low, although, or rather precisely, because only there do we attain clear knowledge of ourselves. If you've yet to realize it by now, especially as I've been promoting the depths as something above the heights, the heights are just as important as the depths. It is easy to see the power of the depths, as well as its vast endlessness, and to just let go of the heights. But this is a mistake. Just as psychologically someone stuck on their heights is inflated, leading to depressions, stresses, anxieties, disassociates, disorders, just to name a few, someone falling into the depths is just as damaging. Psychologically, this represents a weak ego easily consumed by the archetypes, fears, and the group, as well as similar depressive and anxious effects from the lack of psychological balance. And this is the point of the whole video. Yes, to grasp the reality of the depths, but also find that balance of depth and height. Jung says that the heights are your own mountain to you and you alone. This is the singleness that I discussed in the beginning that our times have lost. In our times, our mountain is some created form, money, sex, power, and it's a mountain filled with others clawing up it. But again, Jung says the mountain is yours and yours alone. But that mountain that's yours and that mountain that's mine all lie on the same eternal depths which lie at and below its foundation. Jung speaks about what you find at both the depths and heights. On the heights, you are aware of your best. Additionally, imagination is at its strongest. And at the depths, you're aware of yourself. Jung says that it is only there where we obtain clear knowledge of ourselves. 
But Jung knows most enjoy their best and imaginations and would rather float on the surface instead of piercing into the below that conscious awareness sits on top. And we see a nice subtle hint at the reality of the depths. As Jung says, individuals would rather not know themselves. And it seems a bit paradoxical at first. Because why wouldn't one want to know themselves? They know their favorite TV shows. They know how to work a quote-unquote smartphone. They know a lot. So why wouldn't one want to know their own selves? Their true selves. Because it's not what you imagine on the surface. And I keep saying surface because we can never escape it. Jung continues his commentary. Everything is riddlesome to one who is becoming, but not to one who is. He who suffers from riddles should take thought of his lowest condition. We solve those riddles from which we suffer, but not those which please us. To be that which you are is the bath of rebirth. In the depths, being is not an unconditional persistence, but an endlessly slow growth. You think you are standing still like swamp water, but slowly you flow into the sea that covers the earth's greatest deeps and is so vast that firm land seems only an island embedded in the womb of the immeasurable sea. As a drop in the ocean, you take part in the current, ebb and flow. You swell slowly on the land and slowly sink back again in interminably slow breaths. You wander vast distances in blurred currents and wash up on strange shores, not knowing how you got there. You mount the billows of huge storms and are swept back again into the depths. And you do not know how this happens to you. You had thought that your movement came from you and that it needed your decisions and effort so that you could get going and make progress. But with every conceivable effort, you would never have achieved that movement and reached those areas to which the sea and the great wind of the world brought you. From endlessness blue plains you sink into black depths. Luminous fish draw you. Marvelous branches twine around you from above. You slip through columns and twisting, wavering, dark-leaved plants, and the sea takes you up again in bright green water to white, sandy coasts, and a wave foams you ashore and swallows you back again, and a wide, smooth swell lifts you softly and leads you again into new regions, to twisting plants, to slowly creeping, slimy polyps, and to green water and white sands and breaking surf. But from afar your heights shine to you above the sea in a golden light, like the moon emerging from the tide, and you become aware of yourself from afar. The longing seizes you, and the will for your own movement. You want to cross over from being to becoming, since you have recognized the breath of the sea, and its flowing, that leads you here and there without ever adhering. You have also recognized its surge that bears you to alien shores and carries you back and gargles you up and down. There's a line here that stuck with me since the first day of reading it. That is, to be that which you are is the bath of rebirth. This short phrase can be life-saving. If you hit bottom, if you hit rock bottom, you're in the right fluid to be reborn. Again alluding to our birthing from this essence. If life suddenly pulls the carpet, if the house of cards falls, nothing's lost, because you're on the ground of everything. And this makes sense of the esoteric meaning to Jesus' saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. They're blessed because they're closer to the source. Those on the heights, stuck in their pride, are furthest away. Additionally, in this section, Jung beautifully portrays the dynamics of being and becoming metaphorically. What he's really hinting at is that force, that power of the depths when the ego steps aside, when it sees that it's not the ruler of its house, of its consciousness, because the depths are where true consciousness lies. Other than those quick statements, I'll leave the rest for you to enjoy. But what I'll add is a quote from Jung in a BBC interview. When he was asked specifically when he became conscious. Do you remember the occasion when you first felt consciousness of your own individual self? That was in my 11th year. There I suddenly, on my way to school, I stepped out of a mist. It was just as if 
I had been in a mist, walking in a mist, and I stepped out of it, and I knew I am. I am what I am. And then I thought, but what have I been before? And then I found that I was, that I had been in a mist, not knowing to differentiate myself from things. It's beautiful to see that these inner experiences stuck with Jung throughout his life, as his Black Book experience was well before this BBC interview. And it truly displays the value in doing the work. And this is where individuation takes us, as the ego, subjective awareness, is the heights, whereas the unconscious, specifically the collective unconscious, are the depths. And when you combine the depths and heights, you have the self. Jung concludes the commentary on how the act of imagination concluded, and that's death, and how it plays a factor in being and becoming. You saw that it was the life of the whole and the death of each individual. You felt yourself entwined in the collective death, from death to the earth's deepest place, from death in your own strangely breathing depths. Oh, you long to be beyond. Despair and mortal fear seize you in this death that breathes slowly and streams back and forth eternally. All this light and dark, warm, tepid and cold water. All these wavy, swaying, twisting like animals and bestial plants. All these nightly wonders become a horror to you. And you long for the sun, for light dry air, for firm stones for a fixed place and straight lines, for the motionless and firmly held, for rules and preconceived purpose, for singleness in your own intent. The knowledge of death came to me that night, from the dying that engulfed the world. I saw how we live towards death, how the swaying golden wheat sinks together under the scythe of the reaper, like a smooth wave on the sea beach. He who abides in common life becomes aware of death with fear. Thus the fear of death drives him toward singleness. He does not live there, but he becomes aware of life and is happy. Since in singleness, he is one who becomes and has overcome death. He overcomes death through overcoming common life. He does not live his individual being, since he is not what he is, but what he becomes. One who becomes grows aware of life, whereas one who simply exists never will, since he is in the midst of life. He needs the heights and singleness to become aware of life. But in life, he becomes aware of death. And it is good that you become aware of collective death. Since then, you know why your singleness and your heights are good. Your heights are like the moon that luminously wanders alone and through the night looks eternally clear. Sometimes it covers itself. And then you are totally in the darkness of the earth. But time and again, it fills itself out with light. The death of the earth is foreign to it. Motion. You see it, but your gaze is clear and cold. Your hands are red from living blood, but the moon of your gaze is motionless. It is the lifeblood of your brother. Yes, it is your own blood. But your gaze remains luminous and embraces the entire horror in the earth's round. Your gaze rests on silvery seas, on snowy peaks, on blue valleys and you do not hear the groaning and howling of the human animal. The moon is dead. Your soul went to the moon, to the preserver of souls. Thus the soul moved towards death. I went into the inner death, and saw that outer dying is better than inner death. And I decided to die outside, and to live within. For that reason, I turned away and sought the place of the inner life. Before getting into this material, I want to add a footnote that's relevant to this final section. It reads, I accepted the rogue and lived and died with him. Since I lived him, I became his murderer. Since we kill what we live. This is shadow work. You realize the other in you is you. And when it's lived, it dies. And when it dies, it frees you from its influence, its unconscious grip. For those familiar with exposure therapy, this represents an exposure to the archetypes of the greater personality, the self. As for this final section, death is in focus. 
Jung begins with the reflections on the life of the whole, or the collective unconscious, and the death of the individual, or the ego. And these reflections move him from the wholeness of the depths, as you notice, the warm and cold water, or light and dark, to the so-called fixed and stable heights. You see how death truly humbled Jung in this vision. Since at the heights, imagination is at its strongest, we could see why the fear of death pushes one to the heights. They can imagine they overcome death. But as I said earlier, death is the only way for anything created. This is why Jung says it is good for you to become aware of collective death, because it shows you why the heights are good. Like I said, without the heights, there's no consciousness. Hence death. I think you get the picture. Jung then says one who becomes grows aware of life, whereas one who simply exists never will. And this connects so well with the earlier clip of Jung's BBC interview when he answers when he first realized he was conscious. We'll end this section with a few points on the moon. If anyone watched the act of imagination, you'll remember it plays a part towards the end of the video. The key takeaway is that the moon has been there for generation after generation, watching birth and death, triumph and failure, and it never flutters. It continues waxing and waning day and night. There's a footnote in the Red Book on the Moon which reads, In transformations and symbols of the libido, Jung cites beliefs in different cultures that the moon was the gathering place of departed souls. In Mysterium Canotiones, Jung commented on this motif in alchemy. For those familiar with Mysterium Canotiones, you'll remember there's an entire chapter devoted to the moon, where the paragraph mentioned in the footnote is found. In this chapter, he quotes, Acrobius, who says, The realm of the perishable begins with the moon and goes downwards. Souls coming into this region begin to be subject to the numbering of days and to time. There is no doubt that the moon is the author and contriver of mortal bodies. As the Red Book unfolds, Jung gets deeper into his psyche. He is humbled throughout this vision, realizing the dynamics of being and becoming. These opposites each hold their validity on the path of conscious realization, of life itself, as they cannot be without each other, and it is within these opposites where individuation emerges. One key takeaway from this vision is Jung's willingness to meet the vision where it was. Many go into meditations, active imaginations, with a bias, a mantra, a clear vision. Jung allowed what his psyche was presenting to become active which allowed his true essence, his true wholeness to be. Active imagination is not actively imagining what you want, but allowing your psyche the space to become active itself. Because while the heights are ordered, the depths are chaos. And it is allowing that chaos to be, whatever it may be, that leads one's consciousness to see what it needs to see. And the true power of all this is that the depths in me is the depths in you. And because of this, true empathy, true community grows out of the inner work. When you realize the lowly in you, or the devil in you, then you can understand the lowly, the devil in another. This is true empathy, a true connected community. And you can see how this is the community that I was speaking on, that individuation brings. Because while we're handling our heights, we all can connect with the depths that makes us all one. When, if, society lived individuation, and singleness was truly single, the heights wouldn't be a game of others attempting to climb over each other, but the ego realizing its only competition is itself. What I'll finish with is this. For those who've watched my videos, I speak about belief in knowing, and Plato's divided line. The side of belief would represent the heights, imagination, image thinking, the ego in form, Whereas the side of knowing would represent the depths, reality, essence, the archetypes, the collective unconscious, and chaos. I enjoyed sharing this content and look forward to what is to come in the future. Please like and share this video to help get the material out. Also, leave a comment with some thoughts on this act of imagination. Until next time, stay humble.